Okay, there we go. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, good morning, wherever you are. Um, happy to get started with our webinar today. We have Murray Schoffer from Cornell College, um, who will talk about uh, a very unique methodology uh, at Cornell called One Course at a Time, and Murray will also talk about some of the program. Without any further ado, um, over to you, Murray. All right, thank you. Uh, so, as Syed said, my name is Marie Schofer. I'm the Associate Director of Admission at Cornell College. Um, I actually recently moved into that position. I was previously the Director of Admission at Cornell for the last seven years, um, but I have relocated and I'm working from home now, like we all are, but I've been working from home for the last year um, in Minnesota where uh, my husband got a new job. But I have been at Cornell now for 14 years, and although it is not my alma mater, um, it is a place that I have very strong affinity to, um, not just as my employer, but um, I have seen just wonderful outcomes for our students, wonderful experiences for our students, and so I feel very proud to work for an institution like this. Now, um, as I had mentioned, I am going to be talking quite a bit about our unique teaching method, which is called One Course at a Time. But before I launch into that, I'd like to show you a quick video about the college. Cornell College offers so many unique opportunities, extraordinary opportunities. I have never been able to ask of students on the semester plan what I can ask of students on the block plan. The block plan, or what we call one course at a time, is a unique learning environment where students take one class for three and a half weeks. The block plan gives me 18 days to spend all day long with students focusing on one particular subject. You have these small groups that spend so much time together and you learn from each other. That discussion-based learning was so fundamental to my education. It's focused and it's easier to not get distracted, but it's also easier to get involved in things because of the way our days are structured here. Classes are over by 3, we practice at 3.30. It's the perfect setup of not having to sacrifice academics or my sports life, so it's pretty nice. We have new facilities in the sciences, so the Russell Science Center is a particularly exciting aspect. We involve students in research in small groups, and so I can get to know them very well and provide the support and mentorship that they need. Having the flexibility to be with a student for four hours a day allows us to engage in hands-on activity to learn the material that we're teaching. If it's lecture for four hours a day, anybody's going to start banging their head against the wall, but we don't do that. We've got studio work. We have lab time. We have field trips. <laughs> When you take students to the sites of the content that's being studied, then the material comes alive. Cornell gave me the opportunity to travel abroad, and that really broadened my horizons, and now I tell every student, you should study abroad. It's such a great enhancement to what you're learning at Cornell. When I go to Rome with a class, we are investigating ancient Rome, and we can stand in the forum and talk about it. That is an extraordinary experience in and of itself that is not part of the classroom. And we can do this because there are no other courses in conflict. I've actually been asked by several parents why other institutions don't use the block system if it's such a wonderful way to learn. The block system is very resource intensive. When it comes to your professors, they do a phenomenal job of really making sure that they are available for you. They want to see you succeed. When I'm in a class with students every day, five days a week for a month, four hours a day, we very, very quickly develop a relationship. Students are really in it together. They're supporting each other, they're helping each other out, they're all proud of each other's accomplishments. I have a class with 16 other people, 24 at the most. So you get this community that values learning and that does everything possible to support a higher level of learning. When our students go on to graduate school, they report back that it's easy. It's because they're used to pacing themselves and achieving things in a much shorter period of time. We're just having students going out to great success, and what they're telling us is that the block plan did an excellent job of preparing them for upper-level study, even on a semester plan, and also to go out and work in the professional world. 
There is no doubt that the level of commitment, the level of engagement, the level of accountability is much higher here than any of institutions on the semester plan. The type of commitment to themselves, to their subject matter, to their peers that's possible here, you're not going to find it anywhere else. If you want to make a difference in the world, you come to Cornell. I swear that video gives me goosebumps every time. <laughs> so a big part of that video talked about the block plan, the, the calendar that we use that is integrated into everything we do at Cornell College. And what I've posted on the screen right now um, is a slide that illustrates the block plan visually and what it means to be on a block calendar or one course at a time literally means one course at a time. So you'll see block one starts at the end of August and, and goes through the month of September. For three and a half weeks, students are only taking one subject. So that very first class of the year could be just about any subject. For first year students, it's a first year seminar. But for three and a half weeks, that is the only class that student needs to manage or attend. Um, they're typically going to class uh, three to four hours a day. A very typical schedule is to go to class in the morning at 9 a.m and then take a break at 11 a.m., maybe grab lunch, meet with the professor briefly, do a little homework, take a quick nap, and then go back to class around 1 p.m., stay in class then for another additional hour or two um, to 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. Class at Cornell is out at 3 p.m. though. That is when classes are over in the afternoon and that's when students can really commit to doing their schoolwork if they have got homework to do, which they often do, um, or athletic practices, choir, theater practice, club meetings, any time, type of co-curricular or extracurricular activity will take place then after three o'clock. Um, when my husband worked at Cornell as a coach, he loved that um, at 3.30, everyone on the cross country team could be at practice ready to go. So students are really able to balance out um, their academic lives and their other commitments, whether it be work or sports or theater or whatever. So going back to the calendar then, you'll see at the end of block one, there is a four day weekend. So September 19th, 20th, 21st, 22nd. That's a four day weekend. We call those block breaks. Those are weekends when students don't have any academic commitments. They can just really rest, relax, rejuvenate, and get ready for the next class. Each class at Cornell is, is fairly intensive. You've got to cover a semester's worth of material in three and a half weeks, but it is possible and we do it block after block after block. But students love the opportunity to dive into a subject, learn everything they can about that subject before they have to move on to the next class. Professors love it because they're also only teaching one class. So they are able to also fully commit to that classroom of students, just like the students are committing to that class. Professors also love the flexibility that the block plan offers. Um, there are so many examples of ways that they can use the block calendar to teach subjects more effectively. And I, I wanna provide some of those examples in just a moment. Going back to the calendar again, you'll notice that there are four blocks or classes in the fall semester and then four in the spring. Because of the number of hours that our students spend in class during those blocks, these are actually four credit hour courses. They're spending a lot of time co with contact with their professors. And so we are um, uh, permitted by our accrediting association to award these as four credit hour courses. So students are taking 16 credit hours each semester and they do graduate in four years. This is a four year college, four year degree program. Um, and the other thing I'll also notice about or note about the calendar is that we do still follow kind of a traditional calendar. Most colleges are starting their semesters at the end of August or beginning of September and then ending at the beginning of May. Um, our calendar follows that kind of similar uh, uh, amount of time, which is beneficial for students who are looking for research, internship, or job opportunities for the summer. They are not at a disadvantage because they are either going late into the summer or starting back early in the fall. So creativity, how do professors use this calendar? Well, um, one of the professors that you, you saw mentioned in the video is um, Professor Sampi Hajibu, and she teaches in the economics and business department. One of the things that she has done in her courses are business case studies. So 
at the beginning of a three and a half week block, she'll have a um, business leader that she's made, a con made contact with in either Cedar Rapids or Iowa City, which are the two um, closest cities to Cornell, come into her classroom and present real problems that their companies are facing. Now students do have to sign little confidentiality waivers and, and it's, this is real, these are real examples that they're using. And then the students will break into groups and over the course of the next few weeks, they will dive into these situations and come up with solutions. And then at the end of the uh, three and a half weeks, they um, will actually present their proposed solutions to these business leaders. So it's a really great real world activity for the students to experience. Um, in ecology class in the biology department might use the block differently. Um, they might have vans reserved and students climb into the vans about 8 30 in the morning and they roll off campus to go to a park or a nature preserve to study ecology in a nat natural area maybe they're taking samples for an experiment that they'll do when they get back to campus but they might spend all day out out in this park um, to take a sack lunch with them and at three o'clock come back to campus and, and be prepared to do their other activities or their homework in the international relations uh, department, um, one of our professors there uses the big chunks of time that you have with the block calendar to do um, different sorts of activities as well. So um, within his class, he really enjoys teaching certain uh, diplomacy uh, concepts using a game where students are kind of uh, playing, basically imitating countries and kind of playing with uh, international relations with different world situations. And he has talked about how this game, he tried to use it when he taught on the semester plan, but having a 50 minute or even a 90 minute class period just wasn't enough time to get through enough moves in the game to fully understand, see the big picture of what was happening. But here at Cornell, he might take a class and from 9 a.m. to noon, play the game and they've got a big chunk of time to do that. He's also used the, the big chunks of time to maybe watch a movie. Um, they, he has a class that studies um, uh, genocide and one of the things that they have done is watch the Nuremberg Trials movie uh, in the morning and then they come back and talk about it in the afternoon. It doesn't take them a week to watch the movie in tiny little chunks and then talk about it the next week. They can just watch it and talk about it and get it all done all at once. Um, Another example that I'll provide to back, going back to the sciences is organic chemistry. So one question that you might have in your minds is, uh, how do you teach something like organic chemistry in three and a half weeks? That's a pretty big subject. There are a few classes and organic chemistry is one of those where we do break that into a two block sequence. Um, we call them linked courses. And that allows the subject matter to be spread out just a little bit and it also allows for other unique experiences. So for example, I was talking to a student a couple of years ago, his name was Jordan, he's actually in medical school now. And uh, I said, oh, Jordan, you're, I heard you're taking organic chemistry, how is that going? And I kind of expected him to, I don't know, roll his eyes and <laughs> sigh and talk about how hard it was. But instead, he just got this twinkle in his eye, he was so excited, uh, he said, it's the best class I've had. And I just said, I didn't expect you to say that. And um, with the linked courses, the first half of the organic chemistry course uh, is more classroom-based, more theory-based, and then they move into the lab during the second block of that course, and they're almost exclusively in the lab. And this is why Jordan was so excited, because he said, I walk into the classroom in the morning, I put my lab coat on, and I am in lab all day. Um, so really a great experience for him and those students that you have that might be really excited, excited about the sciences. We also do a lot of co-teaching. Our faculty are just wonderfully creative with each other. And so um, I'll give you an example of a geology and a sociology professor teaming up to teach a uh, in interdisciplinary course on sustainability. Um, and so they did various activities um, and field trips. One of the activities that I thought was quite creative was they um, baked blueberry muffins for the class, divided the class into the groups, and then they had each group do a different type of mining technique on the blueberry muffin to try to extract the blueberries. There was mountaintop removal, there was drilling into the blueberry muffin. I mean, you know, again, 
very hands-on kind of experiences and we've got the time to do that. Um, let me move on to my next slide. I just want to show a different representation of the block plan. On the top you'll see what the uh, semester looks like at Cornell taking the courses sequentially. On the bottom see what courses on a semester taking all those classes at the same time and having to juggle that load uh, of papers and tests and homework assignments. All right, I've got a student quote for you next. My coaches have had huge impacts on My coaches have had huge impacts on the way I approach tennis and life. All of my theater professors and guest lecturers have helped me believe in my artistic ability and taught me the value of long hours of hard work. My biology and chemistry professors have pushed me to learn amounts of information I didn't know my mind could handle. My language and humanities professors have helped me learn to see the beauty in the world. My data and statistics professors have helped me find the joy in contextual detective work with numbers. And my bosses have taught me to be a kind listener. I really love this quote from Gabby because I think she does a, a great job of um, talking about the liberal arts experience as a whole. It's, it's obviously a diverse experience in all of the academic, uh, in the academic realm. She's taking obviously a wide range of classes, but she's also gaining from those experiences outside the classroom as well. Um, at this point, I do wanna talk a little bit about our, the curriculum that Cornell offers. Um, we are a liberal arts college. We do want students to take classes in a wide variety of areas, but of course they're also gonna choose a major. One student uh, question I get from students quite often is, well, if I choose a major, let's say I choose a chemistry major, how does that work on the block calendar? And um, the way it works is a chemistry major usually requires, uh, or most majors at Cornell usually require about 12 courses. You've got a potential 32 courses to take during your time at Cornell. And so it, with a major that off, or requires 12 courses, you may average three courses a year. You may take a few additional ones because obviously you're very passionate about the subject. Um, but you'll intersperse those courses with other things in other areas. And our students at Cornell really value that. Um, a student I knew from a few years ago was an incredibly talented physics student. She actually um, did research on campus after her freshman year during the summer with a faculty member. Then the very next summer was at the Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, in New Mexico, which is a very prestigious place to get an internship. And then her final physics internship, um, the, the summer before her senior year, was actually at a university in Germany. Um, but Laura also really loved creative writing. So she really relished in the opportunity to take a high level physics course and then spend the very next month doing a creative writing course and just really enjoying the, the opportunity to open herself up to be a writer for a month. Um, that's the beauty of the block plan. Starting this fall, we are actually transitioning into a brand new um, curriculum, which we call the Ingenuity Curriculum. We have always encouraged and required students to take classes in a wide range of subjects, um, and the Ingenuity Curriculum continues to build on that, but I think what it does is it helps connect students to the reason why they're taking those courses. Um, this is not just, we don't want our curriculum to just be, you have to check off these boxes and, and meet these requirements and then you get a degree. Instead, we want, to under, we want the students to understand why they're taking it and how it is helping to advance them um, and their education. So I'll just talk a little bit about the foundations um, of this curriculum. There are actually five pillars. Um, the first one is actually called foundations. And these are courses that help students have a strong foundation in their college education. So for example, their very first class at Cornell is a first year seminar course. These courses have a lower class limit um, uh, cap. We have a, a cap of 18 students. Typically our cap is 25 students. Typically our average class size is about 16. In the first year seminar though, the maximum number of students is, is 18. And we are not only teaching a, a kind of generalized subject uh, content in that course, but we're also teaching them how to manage the block plan. It's different for everybody. We don't really have any high school students that have experienced the block plan in the way that we operate. Um, so the foundations course, the first year seminar uh, course accomplishes that. Then during their first year and preferably during their first semester, we ask that students take a writing intensive course. These are denoted with a W in the course catalog. 
and they could be in the English department, but they could be in the environmental studies department too. So we just have certain courses that are designated to have a, a higher a higher number of writing assignments and, and more writing assistance to help students get a really good foundation. We want all students to be very comfortable and prepared in their writing abilities as they advance because they will be writing a lot of papers at Cornell. <laughs> there, the next pillar of the ingenuity curriculum is explorations. Um, no matter whether a student is completely undecided about their major or if they are completely certain about their major, we still want them to explore some areas beyond their uh, immediate interests. So we do ask that students um, take a few courses in, in a wide variety. Again, we offer them a lot of freedom, so it's not like they're having to take course A, B, or C um, to accomplish this. Then they move into building essential abilities. So um, as I mentioned, we do want students to be good writers, but we also want them to have other abilities too, such as quantitative reasoning. Um, there are specific courses, again, not just in the math department that can fulfill this requirement. And again, by having them um, take courses in a category called building essential abilities, we want them to understand that these are essential abilities that you need no matter what your major is, and they can potentially help you. Even if you're an art major, you need to have some quantitative analysis abilities. The fourth is ingenuity in action. What this means are the experiences that students may have outside the classroom, um, leading an organization um, or leading a community service effort, participating in research or an internship, those kinds of experiences that are going to further enhance their education but aren't necessarily a classroom experience. They do have to write a reflection. So if you're the captain of the basketball team, this could fulfill this requirement. One of these requirements, they, they are required to do two. Um, but you have to write a reflection as to how did that experience help you to grow. Uh, and again, this is designed to help students when they get out of, when they leave Cornell and they're ready for their first interview for a job or they're applying to graduate school, we want them to be able to speak about their experiences and, and speak to the meaning that those experiences had in their lives. And then finally, the last requirement is ingenuity portfolio. And the portfolio is basically bringing all of this together so that students do have something uh, concrete. It's a digital portfolio, but something concrete that they can hand to a graduate school or um, to uh, a future employer to say, this is what I've done. This is, this is why it's important and this is how I could help you. All right, I've alluded to this a bit um, as I talked about um, the block plan, but um, I do want to go into this topic a little more in depth, learning about boundaries. The learning takes place beyond the four walls of a classroom. Um, this is something that's really special about the college. We have an amazing ability to go off campus and do field trips and also study abroad. abroad. And hopefully um, once COVID-19, the threat of COVID-19 passes, we will be able to get back out in the field and really do this fully. Um, but Cornell typically has about 20 to 25 classes that will study off campus to one degree or another. And that's not just a day, but that's extended time off campus. So to give you a few examples of what this could look like, in the lower left corner, you see the scuba diver. Um, that's actually Ben Greenstein, one of our um, faculty who used to teach a class in the Bahamas. Um, Craig Tepper now teaches that class. But that course um, was taught in the Bahamas. It's, there was, um, there's both a geology course and a biology course that are taught there. Anthropology has also taken classes to this island as well as uh, English classes. And it's really wonderful because we go in February First of all, it's really snowy and cold in Iowa in February, so it's an excellent time to go to the Bahamas. Um, but students love these experiences because they're able to like get their hands dirty, get, get into the meat of the material they're studying. In Professor Tepper's class, what they do is they are on campus for a week learning and prepping um, what they're going to experience when they get to the Bahamas. And then once they're in the Bahamas, for two weeks, they're at a research station. They are taking samples, they are in the lab, they are doing analysis, they have long days. These are not, this is not just sit on the beach kind of trip, this, this is a work trip and um, with a little bit of play. But they're, they're working for two weeks in the lab and then they come back to campus for the last three days when they present what they have learned. Um, and 
Craig has been taking classes to the Bahamas for over 20 years. They've been studying fire coral while they've been there. Um, and they've just continued to build upon that research and research from this course um, and subsequent research uh, projects has been published multiple times. So um, definitely a, a great opportunity. We've had geology taught in Hawaii. We've had geology taught in New Zealand. Um, we've had classics courses taught in Greece. You saw the art class mentioned in the video that was taught in Italy. Um, this coming year, um, for the academic year 2020 to 2021, we've got a sustainability course taught in Appalachia in the United States. We have a theater course called 20 Plays in 20 Days that is going to be taught in New York, where they will see multiple Broadway plays. We've also had economics courses taught in uh, China as well as Uruguay. Um, so again, hoping that all these courses can, can continue in the, in the near future. This slide may be a little bit hard to read, so I apologize for that. But essentially what I want to share about this slide is that we do not intend to handhold students through their four years of college, but we do support our students and help guide them to resources that are on campus. So especially their freshman year, we want to make sure that they are aware and have access to these resources so that they can get a great start in their education. So I'll point out a few of those. First of all, I mentioned that first year seminar course, they will have a faculty member who is aware that they're a freshman and probably adjusting to the block plan. That's somebody that can be uh, looking out for them. But they will also have a first year seminar instructor. And this is just a secondary person who assists, assists the class. And they're not necessarily a faculty member. They could be a staff member on campus. They could be an admission counselor. One of my colleagues helped with one of the courses. Could be a coach. Could be somebody in the student life office. So there's a wide variety of people who um, can help in this role to help mentor and guide students. Students will also all have an academic advisor. Regardless of whether they're, uh, they have a major in mind or if they're undecided as a freshman, they are assigned an academic advisor. And one of my favorite things about um, the way that we, we do our academic advising is that students are placed in a first year seminar, but they do not choose any other courses until they speak with their advisor during new student orientation in August. Then they choose courses for blocks two, three, and four. Then they meet their advisor again later in the fall to choose their spring courses. And then they meet the advisor again a third time to talk about their sophomore year courses. So at a minimum, they're going to meet their advisor three times during their freshman year, but likely more than that. And that is a huge benefit um, for me in particular. I know that when I went off to college, I just guessed at what I should be taking and it was okay, but not great. Um, so instead, we, we give some additional advising at that point. There's also upperclassmen students who are going to be great mentors to freshmen. Um, we have uh, RAs in the residence halls, the residence assistants um, who are upperclassmen who can help guide students, especially on the social side, making sure that they're getting connected. And then also um, their peer assistant who guides them through the orientation week and beyond. We have programming that extends not just during the week of orientation, but throughout the first semester. And then this slide also kind of reinforces that um, element of support. So this is an aerial shot of our campus. It's a gorgeous campus. Um, we're located in the town of Mount Vernon. Uh, we're not on a mountain, but we are on a hill. And when you're walking down that central sidewalk through campus, it's called the Pedestrian Mall or the Ped Mall for short, you can actually get really beautiful views out into the, uh, the Cedar River Valley and off into the countryside. It's, it's quite scenic. But um, right now you're seeing where our residence halls and our dining services are located on campus. Um, next, I've got uh, the chaplain's office, campus safety and health and counseling services highlighted. Um, those are all available right on campus for students. Um, here are some of their extracurricular uh, activities um, on campus regarding athletics, the arts, intercultural life. And then, um, these blue boxes rec represent the academic uh, buildings on campus and where you'll find classes, faculty, as well as the library right here in the middle. And then finally, the green boxes represent kind of when students are ready to take that next step. So alumni networking is at the bottom, uh, student employment, and then Berry Career Institute. And I want to talk about the Berry Career Institute in just a moment. Okay, this is our location. Uh, Cornell is, like I said, located in Mount Vernon, Iowa. Mount Vernon is a town of about 5,000 people. Um, if you have students that are a little nervous about going to a smaller town, 
I understand. I was also nervous about moving to a small town 14 years ago. And um, I can tell you with all honesty that when I did move last summer um, to Minnesota, I cried a lot of tears leaving Mount Vernon. It is a wonderful, wonderful community. And it is very appreciative of having the college there. And the college is really appreciative to be located in such a wonderful place. One of the reasons that I really liked the location too was that I never felt isolated. Um, Cedar Rapids, Iowa is the second largest city in the state of Iowa, and it's just 15 minutes to our west. You can get to the airport in 20 minutes. It's quite convenient. And then Iowa City is about 30 minutes south. And so between those two cities, there's a quarter million people, quarter million people living right in what we call the corridor area. And so there are a ton of resources. We may be located in a small town, but again, we're not isolated. And then as you can see from this map too, we're within a five hour drive of many major cities. And these cities are, are great for us, for students. Um, they can go and visit these places on block breaks. They can also take advantage of internships here and beyond. We certainly do a lot beyond this, this ring. Um, but we also have classes that utilize these places, even for day trips. We do have classes that will sometimes zip over to Chicago. It's about a three and a half to four hour drive. Um, do an activity in Chicago and come back to campus. If it's worthwhile, they'll, they'll make it happen. I think students are really excited about, about uh, classes in the new building. I think that uh, the building is set up in such a way that there's a seamless uh, transition between classroom and, and laboratory, and I think that's very exciting. In the old building, the transition would be from floor to floor. Here we go from one room right next to a contiguous room, and we're in the lab. The other thing that's pretty exciting about this building, I think, is the open spaces. There's, there's lots of open spaces for faculty and students. Should have given this slide a little more um, preface, but um, this is our new Russell Science Center. It opened, um, I guess, not last fall, but the fall before. Um, this past fall, we actually reopened our um, original science building that was completely renovated. And honestly, when I walked through that building, it, it felt like a brand new building as well. So our science facilities have never been better on campus. Um, the Russell Science Center and the renovation to West Science was a $35 million project. And as uh, Professor Tepper mentioned, the block plan was in mind when they designed this building. So students are able to seamlessly move from the lab to the classroom at any point during the day, and they don't have to worry about uh, stepping on the toes of other classes because it is their space for one entire month. Um, and that's another um, beautiful outcome of the block plan. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention on this particular slide is that Cornell College has um, really made a wonderful jump in the US News and World Report rankings over the last few years. When I first arrived at Cornell, I think we were actually just a little over 100 in the liberal arts college category. Um, for many, many years, we were kind of in the you know, 85 to 95 range. This past year, um, we jumped all the way to number 68. And I feel like this steady march forward has been due to a numerous different things, but uh, just an investment in the college and the students um, in the part on the part of everybody. Um, it's, it's been wonderful to see. But to give you some examples of, of what I'm talking about, um, in addition to this, this wonderful renovation to the science buildings, we also had all of our first year residence halls renovated about five years ago. And also about that time, we introduced several new academic programs. And I wanna mention a few of those. One, we had an economics and business major for many, many years, um, but now we offer a business major. Um, you have to, the students have to choose from one of five concentrations to study that major, and the concentrations are actuarial science, business analytics, finance, management, and personnel management. Um, so that has been incredibly popular. The other um, program that's also been wildly popular has been our engineering program. There are not many small liberal arts colleges that offer a degree in engineering, but we are proud to be one of them. Um, we are up for ABET accreditation this summer, which uh, you can't apply for until you have your first graduating class, and we just qualified for that um, recently. So now we are um, applying for that and feel very good about our prospects of earning that accreditation. We offer both a Bachelor of Arts in Engineering Sciences, uh, kind of a more generalized engineering degree, and we also have a Bachelor of Science in Engineering, so students can choose either route. 
We also uh, offer a BFA in musical theater and we introduced a behavioral neuroscience concentration in our psychology department um, just, a, uh, just a couple of years ago. So those are all very, very popular programs and um, I would certainly recommend them to your students. Um, another category that I wanted to talk about in terms of rankings is that in addition to that number 68 ranking um, that we're really proud of is the fact that we were ranked number one in social mobility. So this tracks um, um, students who, uh, based on their socio income, socioeconomic status when they come into the college, and then what they're able to do post graduation in terms of um, earnings and things like that. And it, it really is a point of pride to see that our students uh, were able to take our students so far. Um, and I just like to, to brag about that a little bit. Um, one other thing that, that I think is a great opportunity that I'll mention on this slide is if you do have students that are thinking about Cornell or the block plan, but are a little unsure of it, we do offer a one course summer institute for high school students. Um, this summer, it's obviously a little bit up in the air in terms of what will happen um, with COVID-19, but um, we have had uh, this running for several years and it is a wonderful opportunity for high school students to come, take a two and a half week course, so slightly shorter, take a two and a half week course and they are taking a course from a Cornell professor and they are earning college credit and they're getting to try the block plan all at the same time, have a fun experience um, living in Mount Vernon for a few weeks. So I would definitely recommend that to your students. Okay, I've alluded a little bit to outcomes and I, I should um, talk a little bit more about that. Our students um, go on to do great things. They are supported by the Barry, Barry Career Institute, which I mentioned on a, an earlier slide. Barry Career Institute uh, assists students, whether they're looking for a summer job, all the way to careers and graduate schools. Um, they start working with students as early as their freshman year, helping them with resume preparation, interview prep, um, all of those kind of basic skills, but they do workshops in, in a variety of topics, and they do individual counseling meetings with students as well. They um, credit, uh, or some of the, the um, ways that we can see their success is um, how successful our students are in, in gaining opportunities. So for example, a little more than half of our students will do internships by the time they graduate. About half will do research, either on campus or at another institution. Um, a little more than half will go on to earn advanced degrees. Um, and that's not just the first year out of graduation, but, but could be a few years out. Um, some of our students like to take a break before they enter grad school. We did do, we have in the last few years done a much more intensive job of, of trying to track our students who are going into career paths. And last year, 96% of our students who were seeking employment got, uh, had employment six months out from graduation. So I think we are, um, that, that success is showing. Um, in terms of uh, graduate school, I'll talk a little bit more about that. We do have a 91% uh, law school acceptance rate, which is a little bit higher than the national average. And we have a 76% medical school graduation rate. And this is twice the national average. So something we take a lot of pride in. All right, paying for college. Uh, quickly mention this. Um, this slide is not necessarily um, perfect for the international audience, but I will say we do have a net price calculator um, and students can use that. We do have merit scholarships for international students, and these scholarships range from $20,000 all the way up to $34,000 per year. We also offer fine arts scholarships in music, art, theater, and dance. There are smaller awards that are $5,000 or less that can be stacked on an academic award. Um, and there are also actually some larger fine arts scholarships um, that students can earn, and those actually go all the way to full tuition. So if a student, if you have a talented fine arts student, they could be eligible for one of those. It does require a separate audition portfolio um, to compete, compete for those. Um, we are also offering a um, small amount of need-based financial aid. We have not done this before. This is our first year, and so we're really looking to help those students who might need a little bit of additional assistance um, on top of a scholarship to be able to enroll at Cornell. And we do have a campus employment program for our international students. Um, I've got one more slide, and then I'm happy to take questions. And this is kind of a fun one that talk, uh, is a video of our students talking a little bit more about Cornell. If I can describe Cornell in one word. If I could describe Cornell in one word. One? Just one? Mm. One word. One word. One word. It would be challenging. Remarkable. Unique. Opportunity. Involvement. Family. Home. Community. Togetherness. Intense. Open. Engaging. Focus. Experiences. Motivating. Caring. Amazing. 
outstanding. Home. Unique. Community. Intense. Magical. Life-changing. Empowering. Awesome. It's really awesome. All right, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. All right, thank you, Marie. Um, I'm gonna turn my video on now. Hello, everybody. I was hiding behind Suchita Ori's name. <laughs> I'm not Suchita. Uh, so I have some questions here, but um, I'll ask one question from you, Marie, and then I'll go ahead and turn on everybody's audio so that folks can ask their questions directly. Um, and But before I do that, please post uh, your question in the comments so that I can invite you to speak. Uh, otherwise, it might get a little messy here. So Marie, I, I wanted to ask you the first question is, when you talk about blogs, um, and Daryl was referring to this question also, uh, please give more information about these block classes. Are students divided into different subject groups per block? So there are uh, about 65 to 70 courses offered each block. So there are so many different subjects to choose from every, um, every month. Um, students like who who have not yet decided on a major can take whatever classes they want and even students who do have a major decided really have the option to take almost every class other than courses that have prerequisites obviously those um, may have uh, requirements but individual classes uh, as I mentioned earlier have a cap of 25 students um, uh, average about 16 students per class but there's they're not really divided Cornell College is not divided into any sub colleges so really students do have the wider array to take any classes that they want does that answer the, the question sorry Hadera do you want to comment any follow-up question on that Okay, the other question is, this is from Prabha, and Prabha, you can always ask the follow-up questions. I've turned your audio on. Uh, but Prabha's question is, do you have traditional exams at Cornell College? Ah, good question. Um, I, if, if the question, if traditional is defined as uh, multiple choice, I would say no. Um, I actually, about a uh, a few month, month ago, six weeks ago, before, before we were all isolated, was at a, a presentation with two faculty, one from the economics and business department and one from biology. And, and somebody asked a question about multiple choice exams. And they both looked at each other and said, I don't know anybody who does multiple choice exams. So I would say that many classes do have an exam of some sort. It's probably more of a, a short answer essay um, written kind of exam. Than a, than a multiple choice type exam to, to conclude the, the course. Um, but there are many courses that will also have a, some kind of different culminating assignment that could be a presentation, it could be a, a paper that the students were writing, um, some kind of project uh, that they are completing, like an engineering class might have a, a project that they're submitting, um, a proposal of some sort. So, Yes and no, I guess is the best answer to your question. <laughs> Hello, Mary. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I hope you can hear me. We so, can. first of all, I would uh, like to thank you very much for your presentation. And then, uh, thank you for your answer. I would just like to ask you whether, uh, when you have the questions, is it at the, at the end of each course? Like you have, the, you just mentioned the written questions or whatever. Is it at the end of each course that you do have it? So every course, again, is going to be a little bit different in how they assess students. But one of the, um, you know, a, a, an English class, for example, may have short, shorter responses that are due, maybe a short response during the middle of the week and a longer paper even due maybe at the end of the first week or the second Monday. But they might have like three small assignments and then one big assignment to conclude a class. Um, but one of the one of the things that that can be challenging about the block plan is that it puts a lot of pressure on the faculty to get dis, um, feedback 
back to students quickly. Students need to know, am I on the right track? Am I learning this material correctly? And so if they turn in an assignment, um, a quiz or, or anything, faculty have to turn that around very quickly. Um, thankfully, faculty only teach one class at a time, so they are able to accomplish that. But, um, but that is kind of a unique element of this course or this calendar. Okay, thank you so much, Mari. You're welcome. Um, okay, hi, this is Hemlata. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I had a question, but this is regarding the summer program. Uh, so I do see on the college website that there are three, you know, summer program that has been, uh, you know, planned for high school students. Uh, with all the uh, changes that is happening around the world at this point in time, many universities are changing those models into online model uh, of, you know, teaching even so that students who have signed up or would like to sign up for a program uh, can make best use of it. So um, uh, any thoughts on, with that regard from Cardinal? Is there any plan to engage high school students online? Um, or if there is something on similar lines, we would be happy to hear from you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. We, um, I, ideally, we would like this to be an in-person experience. Um, as of Right now, with, with the current situation, we realize we may have to move to an online format. We are currently, for our um, traditional students, using an online format, and we were able to quickly adapt to that. Again, the block plan is very flexible and adaptable, so we were on spring break when, the, when, when we knew that we needed to uh, start, so start isolating our um, social distancing. And we just moved all of our block seven courses right over to online courses. So that worked out quite nicely. With the summer program, again, we're really hoping that we can have it on in person on campus, but we don't know if that's gonna be possible at this time. And I think a decision is going to be made in the next week or two, what direction they decide to go with this year's program. Um, in the future, I do believe that, again, we would try to go back to having that on, camp on campus model. Um, for this summer, though, if they do decide to go to an online version, I, I would think that they would still open up the possibility of taking new applicants if you have students that, for example, wouldn't be able to come here, um, but would still be interested in trying out a block court calendar. Just recognize that this is not our preferred nor our traditional way of teaching using the online model, but I do think our faculty are extremely um, adaptive, in part because of the block plan, and, and are making the best of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I had one more follow up question. Um, uh, I'm sure with your experience, you would have seen students, especially from India or, uh, you know, giving those examples uh, from Asia. Uh, what are the, uh, through your experience, what do you think are the preparations that uh, students uh, can have, which would help them, you know, uh, be more comfortable or more prepared uh, before they get into your institution? Uh, what are the important aspects or, you know, uh, things that you recommend students to, you know, keep in mind? Boy, that's a great question. Um, the students that I have worked with, I feel like have generally been very well prepared. Um, and and, a, and per, in particular from India, um, we've had some students who have done really fantastic things. Um, I think for any student, I think it's just a matter of, um, you know, kind of just being mentally prepared for the experience. And I say that in the, in the sense of all the students that come to Cornell, like there's hardly any students that come knowing somebody else. So the students from India who don't know a soul at Cornell, they're going to be in a very similar situation to most of our students. They're not going to be, you know, uh, feel like they have to break into the, the crowd of students who already have connections. Um, so I think that that's a benefit, but it is really important that when you go off to college is to be open-minded, try new things, not be, not be afraid to talk to new people and experience new things, go to, go to new clubs, um, try it out. And I think that that honestly is one of the most important things. Another thing I will say is that um, I feel like many of the international students I work with are, are very high achieving academically. And I mean, I know I, Personally, I was a good student, but when I got to college, I thought, oh, I don't need extra resources. I don't need to go to the writing center. I don't need to get a, you know, someone proofread my paper. I can do that myself. And really, I wish I would have taken more advantage of that. And I feel like Cornell students, uh, Cornell does a really great job of breaking down the, the uh, stigma using those resources. So for example, in a first year seminar course, 
um, it will likely be required that every student in that class go to writing center at once to have a paper proofread so that they have that experience and they see their peers going and it's it's okay it's going to be really helpful actually um, so that's another thing i guess i would say to students is like be open to asking for help it's not a sign of weakness it, it can actually really be a benefit and we have students who are like going on to grad school in english who are asking for their personal statements to be reviewed at the writing studio that's okay <laughs> okay sakina go ahead yeah hi mari um, hi Hi, uh, I just wanted to share some good news and then go ahead and ask question, my question. Uh, one of my students uh, just uh, texted me in the morning that she's got into the PhD program and that was her dream to get into Colonel College. And she's so happy about it. And I said, I'm going to tell this today in the evening when I meet uh, Mary. So that's just uh, the thing I wanted to share. Uh, Great. I'm on. <laughs> So my question was, uh, uh, what are some accommodations given to students who face, uh, you know, disabilities, be it uh, uh, mental or physical disability? Yeah, great question. Um, so we have um, a couple different uh, offices that can support students in those ways. So uh, uh, let's say that um, it's a physical disability uh, or a learning disability. We have a, a student support office um, and there's two st full-time staff members who work with students who um, are able to receive some type of accommodation whether it's extended test time or um, uh, help with note taking or you know a variety of different accommodations one thing that i really encourage students to do is if they know that they are going to need some accommodations in college or have questions about how their learning style might be a fit for the block plan I always connect them to um, the staff in this office. Uh, Brooke Paulson is one of the staff members and she meets with prospective students regularly to talk about this is what, here's an example syllabus for a class in the major you're interested in. What do you think about this? How do you, you know, how would your strengths or your weaknesses um, uh, interact with this kind of uh, syllabus? You know, they have those kinds of conversations. And I think it's really helpful to the students and the parents who are trying to make decisions about, is this really a good fit or not? I will say the block plan for some learning differences can be wonderful and it can also be the worst thing ever. So it really kind of depends on the student and the challenges that they face individually. Um, if it's a, a physical impairment, we also um, do everything we can to make accommodations there. Um, and we have students who um, have different disabilities on campus and, and they are able to navigate our campus. Um, but again, I, you know, we, we have very frank conversations with students. So if, if you're a student who maybe uses a, a wheelchair or a walker, you need to be aware that it snows and there's ice and it's not gonna be always cleared flat down to the pavement because it's just impossible in our kind of climate to do that. So you know, again, we just wanna have those conversations up front to make sure families know what they're getting into. We do also have a health services center on campus that I showed on that one um, visual, aerial picture of the campus. And um, our health center staff is also really accommodating and helpful to students who maybe have some kind of health condition that needs some additional monitoring or, or would require some additional assistance. We do have um, a program now at the college where if a student comes to campus and they don't have a car, if they uh, require transportation to get to a medical appointment, we will help them with that and provide that transportation. So a student doesn't need to be worried about that. There's, there are two clinics. I mean, there's a clinic on campus, but then there, but they can't like prescribe medications. There are two clinics in town that are within walking distance. It's a little, it's about a mile walk from campus or, or one and a half kilometers. Um, so not the easiest walk, but it is possible, but again, we now provide that transportation so students wouldn't even have to walk that far to get to, to the medical center. Thank you. Great. Jenny, go ahead, ask your question. Hello, everyone. Hi, Mari. Hi. Thank you very much for a very informative session. I just have two questions. Um, the first is, uh, it's a pretty easy one. What is the percentage of Indian students on campus approximately? Um, that's a great question. We have, uh, overall, we have about a thousand students on campus and we have about 65 to 70 are international students. Mm -hmm. And I would estimate, I don't have the exact numbers in front okay. of me, but I would guess that there are probably 
five or less that are from India. Right. Um, we have about, I think it's like 15 countries represented. China is the largest group, um, but it's, it's uh, I think there's like 30 Chinese students. Okay. So you also mentioned of all these wonderful courses that students can take off campus. Um, would the expenses for uh, the same be covered in the tuition fee or would they have to pay additionally for these? Good question. There, there are additional expenses for those off-campus courses, um, uh -huh. but the expenses are only for the travel expense. So the student has already paid their tuition. It's, they're not paying uh, any additional tuition fee for the class. So it's just for like airfare and lodging and food potentially. Um, but we really try to keep those costs to a minimum. Um, the, I mean, the trips I think are fairly uh, reasonable for what they're what they're getting. So, for example, the class to the Bahamas I think is something like twelve hundred dollars for two weeks in the Bahamas, which is uh, pretty. I don't know if you could do that on your own um, for that amount of money, and that includes the airfare and everything. Um, we've had a class that has gone to New Zealand for an entire month, three and a half weeks, and that class is usually about four thousand um, dollars. And again, I don't I don't know if you could do that on your own for that that amount. They do a lot to save money by staying at, you know, like the research station in the Bahamas. It's not a luxury hotel, but it's it meets their needs. Okay. But the students are informed some... about the expenses uh, beforehand. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Before they sign up, they know how much that cost is going to be, and there are some um, limited scholarships available. I, I don't like to oversell it because it's not going to cover the entire cost, but. Uh, students, um, a couple things. One, they could earn a, a few hundred dollars from one of these scholarships. They could also, or they will also get a refund on any um, food that they're not eating at Cornell. So if they're going to be gone for three and a half weeks, they're going to get a refund back for that time that they won't be on campus. So that also helps a little bit, gives them usually a few hundred dollars toward the trip. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Uh, Marie, uh, there's a question by Gao, but I think his audio is not uh, very stable, so I'm going to ask his question. He's okay. saying, how big is your international student body? Um, and he says, is it 3%? Majority of students on campus is white, inferred from the video. And in the context of this question, he's asking in the follow-up question is, what are, you, what, are, what are your plans to, to grow your international student body? What type of student will be a fit, will be a good fit for your campus apart from academic curiosity? Um, yeah, academic curiosity is definitely the number one thing. And I think the other thing is having um, a, a little bit of an adventurous spirit because, you know, to, to do some of these courses, students are kind of asked to step outside their comfort zone. And, um, you know, like, for example, that business case study. I mean, boy, if you're a sophomore or junior in college, that's a little intimidating to have a business leader um, who's like a CEO or, or president of a company come into your classroom and, and ask for help. Um, but I, I think that that's an important thing. In terms of our like student body itself, we have a, just over a thousand students on campus. Um, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, about 70 are international students. Um, overall, our student of color population is about 25%. So um, perhaps you didn't see that in the video, but um, yeah, about 25% of our students are students of color. And they come from almost all 50 states in the United States. I mean, we certainly have the students who come from small town, um, rural, agricultural um, communities. And then we have students who come from New York City and LA. So there really is a wide range of students on campus. In terms of what we're doing to recruit more students, um, we, because of Cornell's unique academic calendar, um, I think we do attract students from all over because there aren't many colleges with the block calendar. And so for students who are interested in that type of learning and that type of intensive experience, we, we just kind of draw people from all over. But we also really try to have representation as much as possible. So we send our admission counselors all over the country and around the world. I was actually supposed to be uh, with Syed right now in India. <laughs> <laughs> but, That's right. but I'm here in my house. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely hoping to grow the number of students that are coming from India because I just feel like it's a great fit, especially, you know, now that we've, we've broadened our academic selections. I, I just think that it's a, it's a great fit. 
All right. Um, so another question by Minal, and I'm going to ask her a question as well. How does your school deal with an emergency, emergency situation like the one we are now in for, for international students? Are mm -hmm. they expected to leave? Can they stay in case they cannot leave? Do you provide support? Yeah. So just generally, um, uh, because I had been a director at the college for, for many years, um, I was able to sit in on some of the initial high level meetings talking about what are we going to do as we were facing this pandemic. And I have to say that I was incredibly proud um, in the way that things were handled by my colleagues at the college, um, by our president, by our vice presidents, by our board of trustees, because over and over again, we would start our meeting saying, our number one priority is the safety and health of our students, our faculty and our staff. And, and, and it just, that was how we started every meeting. Every decision needed to be based on that. And I think we really did a great job of holding true to that. Um, and from the get-go, we also knew that there were gonna be students and particularly international students that were not going to be able to leave campus and easily get home. And so we always made an accommodation for those students to be able to stay on campus. And I think right now we have something like 33 students that have decided to remain on campus. Um, I, I know that there are students, like I know of one international student who uh, is on the tennis team and he went home with another tennis player. And so he is, you know, he had a connection um, and was able to, um, to, to stay with a family here in the States. So I, 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 think, I think the college has done a really good job of trying to be very proactive, um, very responsive. And we're, we're still meeting, that, that high level group is still meeting as a group and brainstorming questions that families have. I mean, honestly, Syed, the, the conversation we had yesterday, I was jotting down even new questions that no, we hadn't thought of yet. Let's bring those to the big group and say, how are we gonna handle these situations? These are the questions parents and counselors are asking. This is how we, um, this, this is what we need to have an answer to. So again, I was, I've been really proud of the way the college has handled the situation. Okay, uh, another question that Daryl posted, I didn't see it, but, and I had a related question as well, but let's answer his question first. Daryl is asking, uh, I wanted to ask whether there is a limit of the number of subjects, uh, as in courses, on students. Um, so there, the, the maximum number that a student can take is, is 32, that's eight per year. Um, some students do bring in some credit with them. Um, either they've maybe got a little bit of dual enrollment credit from high school or maybe they've taken like an IB or an AP exam and they can bring in some credit that way. And students can also earn a little bit of credit, a quarter credit for participation in like the orchestra or the choir over the course of a, um, over the course of a semester. And so that can add up slowly over time. But when it comes to an individual block, so a three and a half week time slot, you really can only take one course. Um, it would be overwhelming to take more than one course during that time period. And so for that reason, we do limit students to one class per block. Students do have an option if they'd like to take courses over the summer. Um, typically they, they do that through another institution. We have joined a, a consortium of colleges um, that, that offer online courses. Um, we do not ourselves offer online courses typically, but um, students can go to that network and take a course and, and with the way that it's set up, they know that that course will transfer back to Cornell. They don't even have to necessarily ask um, for confirmation. They, they know that on the front end just because it's listed in this particular portal. So that's another resource for students. There is an additional cost, of course, for those taking courses over the summer, um, but that is an option for students. Okay, we have time for just a couple of more questions. Uh, let's take Gao's question, very uh, yes or uh, a quick question. Is, do you currently have any Thai students on your campus? Thai students? Oh, that is a good question. I do not believe so. There we go. No, yeah. Gao, go ahead, send some Thai students to yes. court. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, another question on courses, Marie. So for example, let's say I'm a student at Cornell and I take, let's say, biology. So in that entire block, I am only studying biology and all of my classmates are just studying biology. And our professor is teaching us, just us. Is that professor teaching anything else during that entire block? Nope, just so, you. 
So just us. So we are kind of married to each other. That professor is only teaching us and as in our cohort. And we as students are not taking any other course. Does that mean that, and, and I, I want to know, I know theoretically it means that that professor could take us out on a field trip. You know, we can do whatever because that professor has no other responsibility for that block. So to do professors take leverage of this opportunity to they take students out and they visit out and do some, you know, there's so much more that you can do. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and, and little stuff like, um, I, a few weeks before um, the, we went to spring break, when we were still on campus, I saw a cute uh, series of photos on social media where one of our uh, statistics professors had joined a class that the class had organized like a late night study group before a study session before a test. And she bought pizza for them and, and brought it to them and shared pizza and helped them go over some of the problems they were having. Um, but that and that's the kind of dynamic you can get on the block plan because she's not overwhelmed with another class, she could say, hey, let me come and help you guys. If you're all working together on campus the night before this test, let me come on campus and, and help you with the problems, or the questions that you're having. Um, but yeah, they definitely take advantage of this. Uh, it's, it's amazing how many examples there are of how they do it. And also sort of a related question. It's not so much for the, I'm asking this more as, a, as someone who runs a company how much of a strain does it put on, 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 on a college like Cornell because you have a very unique methodology? You know, so your classrooms are not you so much. I mean, as an organization, how much, of a, how much of a strain it is and how much do you internally talk about heavy lifting a, a methodology like this? I, well, I would say that it is, like, like the, um, Melinda Green, one of the professors in the video, she brought up how some, some parents ask her, why don't more colleges do this? And it's a perfectly fair question. Mm -hmm. And really what we have found is the answer is, one, it, it is more resource intensive. You have to have a seat for every single student at the same time. Uh, you can't recycle those classrooms multiple times. So it is more resource intensive in that way. Having said that, it's also um, because change is hard, especially in higher education. People are like, semesters work, so why change? <laughs> and it works for the most part, but it doesn't work for everybody. And again, that, that's a point of pride that I take is that I work for a place that's different. And there are students out there who need something different or who want something different, and we can offer that. Now, in terms of that resource um, question, you know, that does come up sometimes. Um, I won't say that it has never come up, like should we think about going back to the semester plan? But I can tell you those, ideas are pretty quickly dismissed. N not in, um, not that we won't, don't, don't ever talk about them, but it's like, no, we like who we are. And, and yeah, maybe it is a little more intensive, but we've clearly found <laughs> ways to make it work. We aren't charging far more tuition than other schools, uh, peer schools. We are, we are kind of in line with our peers. And so we've, we've found a, made a way to make it work. And I, I don't know the budget seat sheet, so I can't exactly tell you how, <laughs> but we do. Is there any other college that you know of who have a similar block? Canada? Yeah, so a little bit of the history. So Colorado College um, actually started the block plan. I don't know if they stole it from somebody else, but they started doing the block calendar in the 70s. And we saw that and our professors, you know, were thinking about how our students were, were very overwhelmed taking multiple classes, not able to focus as much. And so they decided we should give this a try and they voted to change it. So we have, we've done the block plan since 1978. So now it's been over 40 years. I don't think we're gonna be changing uh, to a semester plan anytime soon, um, but there is, there is a long history there and we've had a lot of practice at it. Okay. We have one final question uh, by Anjali. Sorry, Anjali, I didn't see this. It was posted here, but I'm gonna read it out. Um, the Central Board of Secondary Education, which is one of our uh, national boards here in India, will bring in applied mathematics for classes 11th and 12th in all schools affiliated to it from 2020, uh, 2021 academic session. How does it affect admission and how does it affect a student who needs to know have higher course of maths? Well, uh, that's a great question. And I think we'd really have to like evaluate that with each student individually. And I mean, we're looking for students to have kind of a, a base level of readiness 
obviously they want to go into engineering or physics or, or math. It's nice to have some higher level math before you get into college, um, but there are ways that we can also work with a student who maybe hasn't had that higher level math experience, um, but does want to go into one of those majors. The online courses um, that I mentioned are a possibility um, in that area. Um, but I really think that we would have to evaluate these students kind of on a case by case basis. It doesn't, it doesn't um, strike fear for me. I feel like um, I feel like we could work with a lot of these students. It just really depends on what they want to study and what their future goals are. Hope that answers that question. All right, I, I think we have, that's all we have got for today. I don't see any further questions. All right, with that, I think we can close the session. Thank you so much, Marie. And folks, if you have any other question, email, email it to me. Uh, we'll follow up with Marie again and maybe uh, and do another session at some point. Thank you. Wonderful. Have a good night. Bye, Thank Marie. You. Thank you.